In his 1821 Polish language prose work, Pan Jan de Swisswatche Klamasz Wędrujący, Pan Jan from Swisswatch, an itinerant salesman, Jan Hodzko describes a famous fair known to all Belarus, which is visited by merchants from all over the from all over our empire, Cisarstwo, meaning of course Russia. <coughs> In the four weeks of this annual fair, the town of Vyshenkovice, now Vyshenkovice, in eastern Belarus, we tip, uh, Robles, becomes a, a colorful place indeed, where you can find everything you can possibly imagine to fulfill the first needs of all people and satisfy the comforts and excesses of the wealthiest residents. He says, <coughs> goods are sold by Russians, Jews, Greeks, and Armenians, amongst others, and are bought from all points of the compass. The orphanage cities of Riga, Konigsberg, Kolegas, uh, Berdichev and Moscow. <coughs> Throughout the days, I quote again, people of diverse estates, confessions, and nations produce an incessant clamor, presumably a multilingual one as well. So this is just an illustration, a starting point, of how we might understand Belarus as a, historically at least, cosmopolitan place. We have polyphony and variety, both of goods and people, we have a lack of borders which contributes to, this, uh, to these different directions of movement, the borderless expanse of the society. And, uh, but at the same time, we have the name of Belarus. He named this region. Um, and what he means by that is open to discussion. Um, but I would argue that he doesn't, he's not talking about a nation state, of course. Uh, he's not essentializing this place as a place where Belarusians necessarily live, or at least not only Belarusians. <coughs> um, so, despite this inherent cosmopolitanism, <coughs> scholarship on history of Belarusian literature has tended to conform to a nationalist fallacy. An influential and persistent brand of Belarusian literary history claims that Belarus based Polish language writers such as Hodzko or Mickiewicz or Jan Czechot or um, for Belarusian, thereby including ethnic part of belonging, or that they were was infused with the Belarusian spirit, if you like, and thus the number of the dawning of modern Belarusian literature. This claim has two distinct array of components. Um, one is what we might call a fallacy of colonized sovereignty, the belief that there was a single Belarusian language which is politically addressed by nobles, local colonial masters, a unified Belarusian subjectivity, this uh, argument is made, um, embodied in the Belarusian language, was adopted by Polish-speaking intellectuals who expressed international solidarity by consciously crossing a distinct and recognizable border to support the Belarusians. This approach is exemplified by Soviet era scholarship, uh, with his historicist emphasis on the uh, on Olaf, but it's not been significantly revalued to, to this day. Uh, this is what the report by Tsuga the second thread of uh, methodological nationalism has been summarized as follows by Frederick Anderson. If nationalisms are widely considered by scholars to be new and historical, the nation states which they give political expression always do not have an immemorial past and still more important, glide into a limitless future. And this is illustrated uh, by this uh, by the Lee Michael, who says almost all of the Belarusian writers in my were, in one way or another, passing back to the origins of a Belarusian tradition. <coughs> and by searching for a linear and sovereign history of Belarusian literature, literary history often slips into a quest for a Belarusian past and a national point of origin. It therefore becomes a kind of myth making in itself. It both misrepresents its subject. Uh, for example, Polish language authors who are interested, definitely, in Belarusian folk themes, and also plays into a zero-sum game in the politics of identity. <coughs> what I'm proposing is a transnational and cosmopolitan approach to this historically heterogeneous and multi-ethnic territory, um, as we saw at the beginning, uh, the of Hodzko. My starting point is that historical identities in Belarus have been pluriform rather than nomadic and national and correspondingly that no single paradigm of uh, nationalism theory can capture the specifics of the Belarusian case. I would also like to stress 
that this is not by any means delegitimize Belarus as, a, as an object of study. I'm not claiming for a moment that Belarus has a literature of its own, um, although people have their own and it's obviously making no sense. Um, on the contrary, I believe that by expressing cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism as both a methodological standpoint and an empirical fact in this territory, we actually treat Belarus as much more interesting <coughs> than if it were a monolithic ethno-nation. That is rather than asking when and with whom Belarusian nationalism begins, and thereby imposing external standards, imposing its contribution to the development of national culture, I will ask what kind of ident identity claims are made about Belarus by different narratives in many different languages, um, with a focus today on Polish. Um, <coughs> so, the early 20th century Belarusian philosopher, like Amphila Lulic, was among the first intellectuals to conceptualize the history of the country as a broad language and civilization. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, well, the War of Cultures, the uh, slogan, I want you to have been thinking this is a war of cultures, for many people. Um, <coughs> so, Belarus, in, as illustrated by one of the ideas, was caught up in a dispute over the very idea of what Slavdom is, over its meaning and geopolitical scope. Two competing pan Slavisms sought to appropriate the Belarusian masses, treating them as ethnographic raw material to be assimilated. I think if you take this idea of a broad man, you can treat it in two different ways. One is inward looking, essentializing that there is something in between colonized, um, and another is outward looking. I'm going more for the second. Okay. In the age of Romanticism, the eastern part of the former Commonwealth, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, especially Belarus, flourished as an arena for the Polish literary imagination. It drives to tell you the non Polish speaking peasantry was inspired not by an international solidarity, but by a will to restore an original self, especially a pre Christian and therefore pre Latin Slavonic self, in other words, the return to the very roots of identity, searching for ancient traditions that passage of time had rendered irretrievable. A lot of phone writers discovered them in the here and now by putting the simple folk who had been ignored by high culture centuries. Maria Yanyon talks about uh, this, uh, this counter revolution, if you like. Um, <coughs> pagan, anti Latin, symbolic, and northern aspects of culture. Um, so the pioneer of Polish ethnography, Zorian Dolango Hodakowski, was a native of what is now Belarus. Uh, his essay, also the Egyptian Christianism, sparked a huge trend of folkloric expression in both Belarus and Ukraine, especially in poetry. The author argued that, since we started to go water on ourselves from an early age, so we see baptism, um, all of our distinguishing features began to wash away, our spirit's independence was weakened in all manner of ways, and in trying to adapt to alien customs, we finally became foreign to our own selves. That means what the opposite. Um, many other writers follow suit, uh, including other uh, territorially Belarusian Polish speaking intellectuals who contributed to the local Belarusian speaking peasants. Um, the one on the gospel itself also uh, collected over 2,000 different uh, folk poems and collected them and published them both in Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, the first articles about the customs and language of the Belarusian folk appeared in the 1810s, and by the 1840s, the fashion for, uh, sorry, the fashion for Belarus had evolved into a cultural phenomenon in its own right. Uh, Jan again talks about a Belarusian school of, of Polish poetry, uh, as a parallel to the more well-known Ukrainian school. <coughs> to the enthusiast poet ethnographers who collected, translated, or transcribed and then published uh, peasant Belarusian folk songs, Pieśni Ludu or Pieśni Wieśniacze. These inspirations would enable the spirit of Polishness, again, it can be argued what that means, to be replenished with its original, Slavonic and indigenous content. Um, so two authors argue, uh, the wrong one, <coughs> other way. Uh, Kowalski argued, for example, that Polish and Belarusian speaking folk contain an enchanted land, a world of wonders, which, like stories from the East, are full of gold, pearls, and uncountable riches. Um, and we have the same idea in three different quotes of how 
this is a, a treasure to be mined for our Slavonic Polish culture and especially literature, especially writing. It's important in line with the ideas, the organicist ideas of romanticism. Um, implicit in this drive is the playing Belarusian songs for Polish literary culture is the notion that the peasants themselves were ours, which under serfdom, they of course, in a sense, were. Uh, so Lucien Szyminski um, wrote, for example, that our Polish lands, um, they were the same today as they were a thousand years ago in, uh, and more. Um, or Jan Cicot, who is quite well known as the father of Belarusian uh, literature, modern Belarusian literature, um, he wrote that we are obliged to the preservation of our ancient customs and songs. We should be grateful to them for this being subject to the influence of the neighboring tribes and civilizations of Europe to a greater extent that they, we changed with greater ease and native, and thus we forgot these songs. Um, in this way, therefore, the fashion for Slavdom was conceived as the recovery of memory, which had been lost or suppressed, but it also implied a process of spatial mapping. The nation was not only Polish, it expanded into and engulfed the whole of Slavdom, or at least the other Slav peoples of the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Hedopinski, for example, argued, this is also quite well known, um, that it would be part of Poland, Ruch uh, Yawa, that when they trilogize on behalf of, of the Rus, saying that they, will, they should love us, uh, Poland. Yeah, so just make a similar argument, um, but it's also quite different. Lubinsky <coughs> dedicated his book, published in Paris, to the first of the Belarusian yokels, Kevchinus uh, Kmokskis, who learned firstly to read and then to speak and think in Polish. So Lubinsky therefore identified an attitude which placed Belarusian speakers at an earlier, more primitive stage, stage of historical development than Polish speakers, whilst also considering them to be uh, members of the same family. Uh, Cheshot, however, is, um, his argument is slightly different. He, he expresses an apparent benevolence, which stands in contrast to the plain dismissive attitude of the Um But it's also overshadowed by instrumentalization of the Belarusian book. He employs, of course, in this court, a binary, a binary categorization of the us and them. He assumes ownership of the peasantry, as can made between our, our presence. Um, and he also found the local version of civilizing mission and con condescending desire to impart enlightenment in return to the fruit of their labor as well as their legends and feelings. A follow that actually quite similar. What they disagree on is Polishness, whether, uh, whether the Belarusian language that they, were, that they were interested in was part of a... Uh, put it differently. Lipinski argued that Polish was always the language of the, of the Belarusian language. Fitchell argues correctly that the dialects of the Belarusians were the relic of the language of the historical ruling classes of Lithuania. What does this have to do with modern religion? <laughs> um, of course, it looks more like colonialism, and in a way it is. Uh, but it should be noted, this is a, uh, it's been going on about for a while, but I would argue that the main point that colonialism is mostly um, dehumanizing, whereas an important feature of this is that that the Polish writers treat the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian speakers as an inspiration as well as culturally inferior. Um, what we can certainly argue is that it's not the, co the conscious awakening of a new Belarusian literature. It also crosses borders, goes beyond the nation, but also in a sense this discourse of Slavdom was an expression of cosmopolitanism um, in the sense that it, was a con that it was part of the consciousness of world citizenship or broader supranational ties that contextualized Polish or Polish Lithuanian cultural identity against the background of border trends. They traveled extensively, several emigrated, and they read widely multiple languages, also quoting from the likes of Herder or Fauriel in German and French, and expecting, therefore, their readers to understand these languages. Um, <coughs> so, for example, I'm really unfinishing. <laughs> uh, considered uh, talking about this European identity. Um, okay. 
So, what are my conclusions? Wrong way. <clears throat> my basic conclusions are that cosmopolitanism is useful to Belarus, um, both as a way of approaching problems of culture and as, and as a feature of discourse and identity that is inherent in the text that we see. Uh, this can be a critical cosmopolitanism, it's not necessarily uh, an idealized cosmopolitanism. Um, the historical polyphony of Belarusian has an elective affinity, I, I argue, with a rooted cosmopolitan outlook. Uh, I think there's several different places in which you can see this, and I will be writing about this in the book that I'm currently working on. Um, so I'd like to finish with this last quote, which uh, has nothing to do with, to do with Belarus. It is uh, illustrative of the, of the main idea that I'm trying to convey. What if we were to try and be archivally cosmopolitan and say, let's simply look at the world across time and space and see how people have thought and acted beyond the local we would then encounter an extravagant array of possibilities. Um, and I think that it was a great contribution to the Thank you very much. Thank you.